Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me here. You're the uh, most uh, attentive audience I've ever seen. Um, but I know that President Bando is a very dynamic leader, and um, I'm so grateful to her for inviting me here this morning uh, and for her leadership uh, for women, for Jap Japan. Uh, and I know that this institution plays an important role in educating the leaders of tomorrow. So I want to commend all of the students and the faculty for your commitment to academic excellence. I'm here today to speak to the theme, Women Can Change the World. This is such an exciting topic, and it's a great time to be talking about it. As the Prime Minister likes to say, Japan is back. The economy is re-energized. Japan is debating its future. And the answers to the demographic and economic challenges depend on women. Countless studies have shown that women's economic empowerment will benefit the entire Japanese economy. There is broad recognition that this is critical for Japan's future. And most importantly, there is a generation of women who are eager to change the course of history, and that is you. As the first woman to serve as the United States Ambassador to Japan, I know that I am a symbol of change as well. The reception that I have received here and the eagerness of people at all levels of society, both men and women, to advance this issue has underscored for me the power of individual action to bring about larger social change. Japanese women have done it before. During the Meiji period and in the first decades of the 20th century, women fought hard for the right to vote just like their British and American sisters. Individual women also made a huge impact. As early as the 1880s, courageous women like Fukuda Hideko were insisting in their speeches and writings that people's rights had no meaning unless those rights included rights for women. They weren't just talking about political rights, but also about economic rights and equal standing in the family. These women fought for justice, even though they risked serious punishment. Fukuda herself was sent to jail for her controversial opinions, but today she is a great inspiration. In the harrowing days just after the war, Beata Sarota, who was a 22-year-old woman on General MacArthur's staff as an interpreter, had grown up in Japan, and she was responsible for the unprecedented guarantee of women's rights in Articles 14 and 24 of the Japanese Constitution. And from the earliest days of the occupation, Japanese women leaders worked closely with women in the occupation forces to promote women's rights. In radio broadcasts and meetings across the country, they encouraged women to exercise their newly granted right to vote ensuring a huge turnout by women in the first post-war election in 1946. In the 1950s, Japanese nurses pressed to transform the way their work was seen. They wanted nursing to be respected as a serious profession and a lifelong career, not just something that women did for a few years before they got married. And thanks to their efforts, the proportion of married nurses rose from only 2% in 1958 to about 70% by the 1980s. In the United States, it was a Japanese-American, Patsy Takamoto Mink, who became the first Asian-American and the first woman of color elected to the United States Congress. She was the co-author and the driving force behind the landmark legislation known as Title IX which mandated that any institution that receives government money treats men and women equally. Title IX opened up higher education and athletics to women, and its impact has gone on to become a changing force upon broader American culture. It was later named the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act 
and it's transformed American society. Women like these fought for us so that we could have the opportunities that we have today. And we can't let their efforts go to waste. Along with our own mothers and grandmothers and teachers, their examples can inspire and guide us when we are struggling to succeed in a man's world, to balance work and family, to choose a career, to manage a household, and raise young children, and care for aging parents, or just find a paying job. Those are challenges common to all women. And they can be especially difficult in a society like Japan's with a long history of culturally defined gender roles. But Japan has proven over and over again that when a national consensus develops, rapid change is possible. And in so many ways, this is a defining moment. The U.S.-Japan alliance is strong and multifaceted. Both countries are fortunate to have leaders who are committed to women's economic empowerment. Prime Minister Abe has laid out an ambitious agenda in the security, energy, and economic areas. And the empowerment of women is central to its success. Studies show that increasing the participation of women in the Japanese economy could boost the entire GDP by as much as 13 percent. He has ignited a national debate on this issue. Government agencies and companies are responding and progress is beginning to be made. I don't want to suggest that we have solved this problem in the United States, but like Japan, we also have a leader who gets it. President Obama is the son of a single mother who had to accept government assistance to feed her family for a period of time. He's the husband of a woman who grew up in one of the poorest, most dangerous neighborhoods in the United States and worked her way to Princeton and Harvard Law School because she believed in herself and in the American dream. In 2009, President Obama's first act as president was to sign the Lilly Ledbetter Pay Act, which empowers women to fight pay discrimination in the workplace. So in order to take advantage of this special moment, we need to be honest about the obstacles that women face. We also need to be honest about the fact that there are great differences in opportunity for educated women and women who have not received college degrees, as well as between married women and single mothers. Today, we're lucky to be talking about empowerment for educated professional women with skills that are in high demand. But we should not forget that for many women, staying above the poverty line is job one. With almost 15% of children in Japan and 23% of American children growing up in poverty, that is a lot of desperate mothers. In the United States, poverty is a woman's issue. Nearly six in 10 poor adults are women, and more than half of all poor children live in families headed by women. The suffering of these families is all the more reason that those of us who are fortunate enough to have an education and a job need to redouble our commitment to women's empowerment. For educated women, like those of us here in this room, things are looking up. Women in both the United States and Japan receive more than half of the college degrees, and the jobs of the future need skilled and educated workers. As both our economies transition from manufacturing to service, women's skills will be increasingly favored. In order to speed up the process, we need to ask what the most significant barriers to women's advancement are and what each sector of society can do about them. Government needs to work with business to ease the regulatory environment, to promote flexibility in the workplace, and increase childcare options. Large companies need to create a pipeline so that women can rise to the top over the course of their careers. Workplace accommodations for working mothers are urgently needed so that talented women are not forced out of their jobs when they start a family. Countless management studies show that companies with high level participation by women are more profitable and better run, and that giving people more flexibility on their work schedule not only increases their job satisfaction, it also increases productivity. 
Working doesn't have to come at the expense of family life. In 2011, study in the United States by the highly respected Pew Research Center, 72% of women and men between the ages of 18 and 29 agreed that the best marriage is one in which husband and wife both work and take care of the house. When husband and wife function as a team to work and raise their children, it creates a strong bond and mutual understanding. And for people who worry that working outside the home means women have less time to raise their children, another Pew Research Center study released last year show that in the United States, where working couples are the norm, the amount of time parents spend with their children is actually increasing. From 1965 to the present, fathers have nearly tripled the time they spend with their kids. And surprisingly, today's American children are also spending more time with their mothers than they did in the 1960s. This may be somewhat abstract and in the future for many of you in this room, because people often ask me what they can do right now. And that's true. It's true that sometimes, in order to change the world, you have to change yourself first. And you here in this room are in the perfect position to take an important first step, studying abroad. In the increasingly connected 21st century world, Japanese companies need to globalize to survive. The Olympics are coming. Japan is playing a greater role in the region. All these efforts need global jinzai to succeed. That's why the Japanese government is committing millions of dollars to help Japanese students study abroad. It's also why President Obama and Prime Minister Abe announced a joint United States-Japan goal to double the numbers of exchange students. Right now, the majority of young people studying abroad are women, and that's going to give you the edge you need. Studying abroad isn't just a fun way to spend a semester. It's quickly becoming the key to success in our global economy. Because getting ahead in today's workplace is not just about getting good grades or test scores in school. It's about having real experience with the world beyond your borders, experiences with languages, cultures, and societies different from your own. The research shows that American students who study abroad get jobs in their fields more quickly than their peers who did not study abroad, and they start out earning about $7,000 more per year. Research in Japan has shown that students graduating from overseas universities get jobs in their fields more quickly than the graduates of all but two Japanese universities, and graduates of overseas schools earn more earlier in their careers, too. Studying abroad is about so much more than just improving your own future. It's also about shaping the future of your country and of the world we all share. Because when it comes to the defining challenges of our time, whether it's climate change or economic opportunity or the spread of nuclear weapons, these are shared challenges. And no one country can confront them alone. The only way forward is together. If you study abroad, you will return home a different person, more self-reliant, wiser, more mature. You will learn a lot about yourself. You'll teach others about your country, your values, and your traditions. You'll learn new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things, and you will be an ambassador for all that is great about Japan. You will make friends that will last a lifetime and you can get a job that you love, that you can keep even after you're married and have children, if that's your choice. The good news is, if we believe in ourselves, we really can change the world around us. Confidence turns belief into action. And today, change no longer comes just from the top. In a democracy, all citizens have a responsibility to work for a better society. In the United States, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the inclusion of people with disabilities, and today's efforts to ensure full civil rights and marriage equality for the LGBT community have taught us that social justice and individual empowerment 
come through countless acts of courage and commitment. We can't all be the first female prime minister or president or CEO, but we can all become architects of change in our own lives. And each time we stand up for ourselves or ask our husbands to help us a little bit more or convince our boss that flexible work time will lead to better results or pitch in for a colleague at work who has a sick child at home, we will change the world around us. And those tiny changes add up. They give us the confidence to continue and the courage to believe that we are part of something larger than ourselves. They give us the knowledge that our efforts will make it easier for our daughters to succeed and for our sons to experience more of the joys of family life. They send out a ripple of hope which touches every life that we touch and is passed on to all the lives that they touch in turn. So each act is magnified over time and across generations we will transform the lives of people we don't even know. And here in Japan, you are the generation that can change history. Not everyone is lucky enough to get that chance. Every single person in this room can make a difference by taking steps in your own life and by working with others. It's the right thing for your country, for your family, and for your future. One of my favorite quotes is from Margaret Mead, the pioneer anthropologist who studied change across many societies. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you so much.